Welcome everyone. This is Elizabeth Edwards in Montana and I'm so pleased to have you join us this evening with Amin Javi who is going to give us a presentation about technocracy, smart cities, and the pervasive invasive controls that are coming into our small towns and communities from the global agenda. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our host and speaker, Amin Javi. And Amin comes to Montana from the Silicon Valley, where he had a high-tech career spanning over 25 years. And he was at the forefront of video and camera technologies in the Silicon Valley. He has co-founded two camera startups. And if you have a camera in your phone, or stream video or movies, he played a part in that technology. Amin is a bachelor, has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in chemistry from India, a master's in electrical engineering from Pennsylvania State, and studied computer science at Stanford University. He's an avid photographer, a world traveler, and a private pilot. So we are so fortunate to have him with us because he is a lover of liberty and he um, loves to share with all the, the information that he can share with us so that we can join to stand up together. So thank you, Amin, and welcome. Thanks, Elizabeth, for the kind introduction. Uh, is my voice clarity good here? It's just wonderful. Okay. So thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, I see names that I've seen here before, so good of you to come back. Uh, hopefully people will bring more and more people to these presentations as what I'm about to speak on is uh, absolutely pertinent to every human being in the world. And uh, I've been trying to raise awareness for many years about what's going on in the world. And it's been quite a challenge. Um, so a couple of years ago, I decided to make a visual presentation that was relatively easy to you know, understand through visual images. And since then, uh, I think I've been getting more traction in people trying to understand the complexities of the global agendas. So at the heart of what's going on in the world, from Ukraine to Iran to Palestine to Israel to what's happening in the United States and beyond, is the digital identity. And as this presentation goes on, you begin to understand how this digital identity via our biometric facial recognition is going to essentially enslave us into a digital dictatorship. And uh, this agenda is coming from the United Nations uh, in the name of sustainability and climate action. So it's a lot to unpack, and I will unpack it for you within uh, 50 to 55 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the concept of what is facial recognition. From there, I'm going to talk about cameras and surveillance installations all around the world, including China and the United States. From there, we make a jump to what are smart cities and how the surveillance in smart cities is directly linked to a new financial system. And from there, we go into more details on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, its applications in finance, in banking, in uh, educational systems, and beyond. And then I'll wrap it up after that. And then we'll have an open Q&A for an hour or longer as needed. So here are some of the logos and terms that you would have been observing for the last three years or more, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They sound quite uh, cute and uh, not harmful at all. The fourth industrial revolution, build back better the new international economic order. Uh, there's also the concept of the great reset, which has been you know, uh, talked about in many mainstream magazines and newspapers over the last few years. They are predictively programming a civilization uh, with this term, the great reset, as they want to reset all systems. If people haven't read Klaus Schwab's book on the Great Reset released in 2020, I recommend it. So just a background, as Elizabeth said, I have a few degrees in you know, science and technology and engineering. I was in Silicon Valley 
for over 25 years. I founded two camera startups, raised a lot of money for the corporations that I co-founded. And so I understand how the money comes from the Federal Reserve down to private equity walls and the venture capital and how the whole agenda in Silicon Valley and beyond has been implemented for several decades. Uh, I have worked on imaging and camera technologies that have gone into products from, you know, uh, autonomous driving cars to smartphones to robots, drones, and all that. I worked on video and audio streaming technologies that became part of international standards that are being used today in various applications that the world uses. So I think the point here is that I have subject matter expertise and deep technology um, experience in Silicon Valley and have been able to link all the dots together quite well. Uh, so how does facial recognition work, right? The introduction is and the benefits given to you for your smartphone are it keeps your data safe and your phone unlocked, right? So what happens is there's an invisible near infrared camera and projector in the front of your phone and the projector projects 30 or 60,000 dots on your face. And that dot pattern gets distorted based on the contours of your face. And the near infrared camera then captures a photograph of that distortion in real time and then is able to reverse engineer the accurate features of your face and identify uniquely that that is you because everybody has a unique footprint. So that's how facial recognition works in your smartphones uh, on Cameras that are tethered in stores and public places, it works slightly differently. It uses, you know, distance between your eyes and distance between your nose and eyes, etc. So it's not as accurate outside, but on your phone has a 99 plus percent accuracy. Right, so in the last 30 plus years since the 90s, when the PC and internet came into our homes, we've been given subsidized technologies from game machines to PCs to smartphones and so these are the carrots given to us for convenience for safety and security you know and cameras and surveillance is also the carrots to catch the bad guys and now it's all about sustainability through the UN and you'll see how the sustainable agenda is all linked to this by the end of the presentation you'll also see how the sticks are coming. So it's the carrots don't come on their own. They come with sticks in the end. And it's going to be really bad. So I was at a conference in China, Optical International Conference in 2019, September, so four years ago. And I saw how the infrastructure of surveillance, cameras, radar, etc., had been installed there. I was absolutely shocked. And so Big Brother has already met Big Data. And in China, they've been using facial recognition linked to effectively a digital ID and an app on your smartphones which gives you social credits and then is used to control human beings by controlling their behavior and compliance. Because if you don't do what Big Brother and the government tells you properly, your social credit score is reduced and everybody has an app that they are able to look at it and this has been going in China for well over five years through various apps including Alibaba and uh, they have a WePay etc. The narrative by the Western media is that privacy and freedom are dead in China and that they indeed use a social credit system to control their people and implicitly all these documentaries and you know narratives that come on ABC, BBC etc all basically imply that we are free in the West. But what is not said is that cameras in the United States by the end of 2022, cameras per capita in US were greater than in China. We have 50 million cameras installed by end of 22 compared to 200 million in China. London in the UK is ranked number three in the world in cameras per thousand people. So the infrastructure is in place in the West. They are already scoring us. It's just that we haven't been given an app to look at our social score. And this infrastructure is expanding. By 2025, $2 trillion would have been spent for the infrastructure of smart cities and surveillance in the world of cameras, smart city lights, 
smart street lights, radar, 5G infrastructure. So while the world was sleeping when COVID was announced in 2020 and everybody was, you know, sitting at home watching uh, fear TV and lockdowns around the world, they were installing cameras and surveillance infrastructure. There, a report came out last year, by the end of 2022, one billion surveillance cameras tethered to the internet have been installed around the world. And if you take cameras which are not tethered, and if you do all the data collection, optics and cameras, including your smartphones, etc., there are greater than 20 billion data collection devices that are active every single day around the world. So the old days of monitoring with human eyeballs is gone. What we have today is smart artificial intelligence security guards that are watching us 24-7. So the human beings aren't necessary. These are all effectively cameras with edge AI and cloud AI processing all the data that they're looking at. So when are we not alone? Pretty much never. Because even when we are inside our homes, we have eyes and ears at home. Excuse me. So even at home, we are innocently helping Big Brother and giving our data up voluntarily pretty much. So if you have devices or apps or um, other you know, technologies from companies like Facebook, Samsung, Google, Apple, Microsoft, you use Zoom and free conference call as we are. Our data is going to the cloud and AI is scanning the data and all the pertinent information is being stored on blockchains. So be very careful on what technologies you bring home, uh, how much you use them and how you use them. So if you have a ring camera for safety and security, please do some research because Amazon's Ring camera is, builds a, what they call a mesh network in your house. All your Wi-Fi uh, connected devices are then connected to this mesh network and Amazon is capturing real-time data on all your devices as well as your behavior, your movements in, inside your house within one meter accuracy once you get this new generation of Wi-Fi technology in your house. The accuracy is within one meter. A few years ago, three, maybe five years ago, I was raising money for one of the startups um, and I went to a VC conference. There was this big topic on the Internet of Eyes and I've never heard of that you know, phrase, but now I begin to, now everyone can understand why they have that phrase. Because now the goal is no face or identity left behind and that's kind of one of the UN SDG agendas. They have cameras at intersections. They have cameras inside and outside all modern cars, including radar and LIDARs to capture 3D real-time um, data from all around the world. They have facial recognition cameras on streets. They have cameras in space. Um, there's a company called, um, I forget the name of the company, it's funded by Elon Musk. Uh, I met their founders about eight, nine years ago. Planet Labs, now I think it's only called Planet. And they were launching space cameras, tiny space cameras uh, in the thousands. We have drone cameras, we have license plate readers, all modern auto automobiles today, and in the future have infrared cameras in the rear view mirrors, uh, looking at your eyes, tracking your eyes, scoring your emotions, um, so what we are living in is a panopticon. This is a photograph of a prison in Rhode Island in the late 1920s, which is a circular prison, where all the cells of the prison, prisoners are being and can be monitored by prison guards in the center. And we are living in a digital panopticon. Right? When, while no human being is looking at us, we have computer vision and artificial intelligence based cameras looking at us pretty much all the time. And then even inside your prison, think of it as cameras surrounding you. So this is a panopticon within a panopticon. 
So I spoke about, you know, what is facial recognition, talked about the cameras in China and surveillance in China, I talked about the numbers. Now I'll introduce a concept on smart lights and smart poles. And if people have been observant over the last three years, you would have seen your towns and cities changed quite significantly. Um, at night, the cities have toxic, bright, artificial light everywhere on every street and they are put on smart po poles which are all connected to each other wirelessly and they communicate underground via fiber optics to 5G microwave towers etc. So between towns and cities you have smart corridors and smart cities and all your cars and all the data is being tracked. When you're walking under a street light the, the street lights are monitoring your Wi-Fi devices so if you're carrying a phone etc. And what these smart lights and smart poles in the future, in fact, already started, they have the capability to add various things like a Lego. Right? They can have noise sensors, people counters, surveillance cameras. Many of these uh, specs I've seen for the lights, they have drone charging stations on top of them. So the future of policing will be you know, aerial autonomous drones. Uh, so all this is coming in the name of safety, security, and sustainability. So people need to really think through what is being done uh, in America and beyond, and whether you want to live in a society like this. Right? There's a little town two hours south of me uh, near the Bison Range. When I came to Montana a little over three years ago, there were no lights on this highway through this town. A year and a half ago, I was driving, and there were hundreds and hundreds of lights and this is all being done in the name of energy conservation. So we went from zero lights to several hundred lights in this span of about three miles. So think about that. Somebody sent me a photograph on the right side from Canada uh, and I dug deeper. I found a project that was funded by Department of Homeland Security in 2008. It's called an LED incapacitator, also known as a puke ray. It's meant to disarm so-called dissidents and terrorists. Uh, this is a type of an, uh, you know, multicolored red, green, blue uh, LED light where the frequencies can be alternated at a very high rate and the amplitude obviously can be also modified depending on the energy supplied. And this type of lighting causes intracranial pressure and can cause, you know, spinal damage and can potentially kill you. So these are the kinds of technologies that are being, uh, you know, put up. Uh, I encourage everyone to be extremely observant when you step out into your towns and cities and your neighborhoods. Take pictures and sh share them around. Anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, take high quality pictures, share them around. And feel free to, you know, uh, reach out to me if with pictures and if you have questions. I can be reached, uh, I can be reached at my YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So now I'm going to move to defining the digital identity as introduced by the World Economic Forum. Um, in 2018, a paper was published by the World Economic Forum where they talked about the digital identity and said that this is a new chapter in the social contract, a social contract that none of us have signed up for. Nobody has discussed with anybody, but this agenda is being now unrolled in every single country around the world. So every person is going to have a digital identity, every device, everything, which is the Internet of Things, and every entity. That means from automobiles to buildings, every tree is going to have a digital identity, etc. They're going to map the entire Earth and the surface of the Earth and whatever else it possibly can into a digitized version of itself. So in the physical world that we live in, we will be required to use our digital identity for every activity that we have from, you know, healthcare to finance and banking, to buy food, to travel, to buy a plane ticket, etc. And that digital identity will be linked to your biometrics, primarily facial recognition. So your face will be used to unlock activities via your digital ID. On the other side, your digital ID 
is linked to a new type of financial system which is going to be a digital currency based on your water and carbon credits, your social credits or reputation capital and your medical status whether you've been taking your you know COVID jabs and other boosters and this is going to effectively be a currency of compliance because if you don't comply your scores on all these fronts or some of these fronts will go down and your digital currency effectively goes down so in the new type of financial system that is in progress being built and will be turned on little by little over the coming years the more compliant you are to Big Brother and government and to corporations the richer you will be so your slavery is inversely proportional to your wealth so think about that and so this is effectively people have heard of ESG which is environmental social and governance in corporations our digital currency effectively will have be an ESG score at an individual level right E being environmental related to carbon and water and other environmental things S is social so our social credit based on our likes on Facebook whether we agree with Black Lives Matter whether we agree with the Ukraine war agenda whatever so effectively what they are building into our digital identity is our digital prison because we will be in an inverted prison where we will have complete restrictions for everything and we will need to take permissions to do anything right so why is this happening one is at the highest level it's for control and it is also about taking away the little sovereignty that we think we might have left as individuals and as nations so the future of money is going to be this digital currency it's going to be based on your identity and it's going to essentially introduce identity slavery and if people understand the current money system we are in we are in a fiat currency system which is a debt slavery system so we will transition from a debt slavery system to an identity slavery system there's going to be a complete eradication of the value of all fiat currencies including the US dollar so it's really important to understand how important this is because since 1913 and the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act and the bank about 99 percent of the US dollar value has been eradicated and they're coming for the last one percent and then once the US dollar is completely shattered this new international economic order based on carbon primarily is going to be introduced and how are they going to implement this through the digital identity of you as well your assets so think of it as a programmable token right so in the center is information what the asset is where did it come from who owns it etc so it could be your house it could be your car etc it could be the money in your bank for now or your digital currency but each asset is defined and controlled by rules surrounding it what the asset can and cannot do another way of thinking of it is that there are smart contracts that are implicitly written in software and code which define these assets so think of it as if you have an asset today which is a house that you've paid off in the future this house will be locked because of your safety and security so nobody can get into your asset details that asset will be put surrounded by rules and effectively that's called tokenization so all your assets will be tokenized which means they'll be governed by rules the governance of those rules will come by Big Brother which is private corporations or United Nations or World Economic Forum and you will have to take permission anytime you want to access your assets and they can lock you out of your asset anytime they want 
So think about that. This is the future of money and you know asset ownership. In fact, they, effectively there is no ownership because the rules will govern what you can access. So how are they going to actually implement it through technology? This is through a cybersecurity protocol called Zero Trust. So we will go from implicit allow to a world of default deny. So like today, if you go to a grocery store, once you enter the store, you can pretty much go and pick up whatever you want into your cart. In the future, you will be denied everything and you'll have to take permission to pick up whatever you want from a grocery store each single time, right? And the, at the heart of this, it's linked to your digital ID. So our future is going to be filled with restrictions and we will need permission. So it's like unlocking your life in real time all the time based on your digital ID linked to your digital currency. Here's an example of how zero trust will be used in shopping. This girl's gone to the store. All products are behind plexiglass doors. And uh, there's a reason why all these, you know, hooligans are being paid in cities like Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles to go into retail stores and pick up products and run out in their hoodies. It's not being done organically. It's being done by design. Primary reason is to put cameras and more security and surveillance everywhere. Another reason is to put all the products behind doors and then they'll put 3D cameras linked to your digital ID on each of these doors and it'll be about conditional access. So if this girl goes to this store, she wants beef, beef but her carbon credit has gone down because she's eaten too much beef for the first half of the month, that door won't open. If she's had too much sugar for that week and she wants orange juice, that door won't open. So this is the kind of world that we are living in because all the currencies are tokenized, so equivalent to smart contracts. So there's a concept called IDAS, which is identity as a service. There's a lot of companies building businesses around that. So every time your face is in front of a camera, a chain of corporations are making money in real time through the photons that are being captured. There's another concept called geofencing. It's related to your face and digital ID, and it also implements access control or limits your access. So think of it as a, an invisible fence beyond which you cannot travel. So you could be geofenced in terms of traveling around the world. You can be geofenced how far you can drive, how far you can walk. 15-minute cities are being introduced around the world. Uh, in Oxford, they brought up this concept a year ago almost. And now you can hear about this is happening in many parts of America too, right? You can be geofenced by the, your digital currency being turned off beyond, say, two miles or five miles. Uh, you can be geofenced in the metaverse. We already are. All the censorship on Facebook, etc., is effectively geofencing, right? Who can read your posts? who your posts are going to, who's being censored, who's not being censored. So all the surveillance infrastructure of smart lights, 5G, um, cameras, radars, etc., they're all being installed to collect data on all activity that's going on and all human beings that are living in those cities. And so Data is the lifeblood of smart cities and it's on the pretext of a zero carbon footprint for the United Nations and the climate action. So the pretext on which they are selling it is put to putting sensors everywhere for air quality, lighting, water management, noise pollution, traffic monitoring and energy management. Know that all the language that comes from these uh, organizations is all in inversion. So monitoring air quality is really about limited mobility and no car ownership. They want surveillance and control via an LED grid and it's about data collection. The plan is to ration water going forward and that is why there's all this uh, theater going on in places like Montana where they are giving the water rights to the Indian tribes which they have incorporated and through the in cooperation, they're going to force water meters on everybody's well, etc. Noise pollution sensors are about speed surveillance. Um, traffic monitoring is really about 
mobility tracking of everything and energy management is all about rationing electricity, gas and heat and there's a reason why wood stoves uh, are not allowed in new homes in California for instance. Right, so at the heart of all this is the digital ID because to make all this work, all the activity that the sensors pick up from cameras to radar to LED lights, it's related to the digital ID of the device, of the object, of the vehicle and of the people. So United Nations Charter is the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I would highly recommend everybody go to UN website and start studying up on all these goals. Uh, know that all the language is inverted. So for instance, uh, the first SDG is no poverty. And the goal is to bring down the uh, you know, financial level of all first world countries actually and make them poor like third world countries. Second one is no hunger. The goal is to get rid of all natural farming, all cattle farming and eventually move to synthetic foods and 3D printed meats. So things like that. Um, so n go and read those SDGs and try and figure out what they're actually trying to do. And all these SDGs are being done for net zero 2050. They want to bring down the activity of everything in the world for a net zero carbon by 2050. Carbon is the gas of life and everybody is being gaslighted on this agenda essentially. But it is all linked to a digital ID and surveillance. And this is how they are pushing it. So in the name of sustainability, they are going to harvest data, combine them with fake legal instruments to manipulate life of humanity, manipulate life of animals and all natural resources. And in order to do this, their goal is to me continuously measure, analyze, monitor, monetize and manage and control everything in the world, including all the people. Right, so the sustainable development goals is really about moving to this new type of carbon currency with control and it's the new international economic order and I'll tell you more about this as we go on. At the corporate level, they're using corporations to implement this agenda and with this concept called ESG, which is environmental, social and governance. So corporations will be forcing their suppliers and customers to also be ESG compliant and go along with the green agenda and they're going to force their employees to do that too. So every company has an ESG score now and the ESG score depends on how they're enforcing the ESG agenda. Right? The S aspect is the social which is related to a DEI index, diversity, equity, inclusivity. And uh, they use any type of instrument or variables to manipulate the DEI. So in the last three years, they were using social justice, criminal justice reform, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ agenda. So, so for instance, let, let's say there's a board of six white men. If they remove one white man and replace it by a colored woman, their DEI score goes up. If they relate, remove another person and put a trans black woman from a third world country, their DEI score goes up. So that's how they're manipulating the behavior of corporations who then enforce behavior on their employees because the employees get a paycheck and bonuses and uh, if the employees don't comply they'll lose their jobs right and governance is about what all places uh, what all divisions and departments and people they have in place who are going to govern and enforce the e and s aspects of this agenda so they're using corporations not governments to force compliance on everybody, on other companies as well as people in companies and individuals. So we are going to be moving from a current system of shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, where the stakeholder are the people who are implementing these agendas at the very, very top. Right, so one of the ways to think about at, a, at the highest level is they use a concept called the Hegelian dialectic. Uh, so people should go and research that, but really it's about creating a problem, 
getting a reaction or creating a narrative that this is the reaction and then introducing a predetermined solution for everybody. So it's kind of the blueprint for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, right? So what have they done? You know, they've been harping about climate action and climate change and global warming for well over 40 years. But it really, the uh, narrative started to get amplified in the 90s. So what's the reaction? We, we need to save the earth. The earth is burning, the human beings are the problem, and we need to limit everybody's uh, access to nature. We need to limit everybody's activity, driving, etc., in the name of the planet and environment. And what is the solution? The new international economic order, digital currency based on carbon and behavior, as well as the fourth industrial revolution. And how are they going to do it in practice? Via smart cities and by putting everybody in smart cities so that they can be tracked and scored, analyzed, and then managed and monetized. Right? So the blueprint and architecture is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the instruments for implementation are ESG by corporations, public-private partnerships, which are really private-private partnerships because all our governments, federal, state, and local have been incorporated. And then via non-governmental organizations or NGOs that are implementing smart growth through community land trusts, land value capture, high-density zoning, affordable housing, and companies like ICLE. And people don't know what ICLE is. It's the international... Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. So they've started changing the name of ICLE now since people started to catch on. But there are all these NGOs where you live that are implementing smart growth. So if you want to go and see what your smart city plans are, go and type in smart city, uh, you know, San Francisco or smart growth San Francisco or equivalent types of phrases. And so this is at a highest level how they are creating the problem, getting a reaction, and then implementing a solution, and most people are going with the agenda. And again, at the heart of all this is the digital ID, because the digital ID is needed to be tracking everything and managing everything and controlling everything. And just to give you a, an added note is the fourth industrial revolution is, is related to us moving towards uh, robotics and living in the metaverse more and more and more. So, for instance, if you work in a company and you build, say, cars, uh, it's already started. Uh, people should go and study NVIDIA's Omniverse. Now, all sort of simulations and uh, prototyping is done in the metaverse, essentially, before production starts. Right? So, like summary number one, in the name of security and privacy and now sustainability, there's a Trojan horse being introduced and inside the Trojan horse is a digital ID. And that digital ID is all about control and com total compliance. In education, if you have kids or grandkids, you would have heard about SEL, social emotional learning. And it's about capturing data of every child from cradle to career and being able to manipulate them. And at the heart of that is the digital ID. For instance, kids are in front of screens at home, in front of screens when they're in their schools, they have cameras in schools. So AI algorithms are always screening children's faces for child abuse. And if the AI decides that the child is unhappy, they can send child protection services to get your child. Right? Kids, there are board games going on with LED screens. They have fisheye cameras below them. And these are products that have been in the market for two years or more. We play smart. They are monitoring kids' eyes and faces and being able to manipulate what is displayed on the board. And child data is also big business. So if you're ch sending your children to school, they are being monetized in real time uh, by a co concept called social impact investing. So investors in Wall Street, they are not only 
connected via devices to the children, but they are uh, taking the scores, the social emotional learning scores, and putting them in prodigy asset groups as securitized markets, and then they are able to bet on their future of the kids at any time, and uh, they're making money. So know that your kids are right now being monetized if they're going to public or private schools. And so the emphasis on the whole system is on social and emotional control and not about gaining knowledge for the kids. Here's a UNICEF initiative called Kid Power where they are giving free or subsidized smart watches to kids and telling them to get active and save lives. But it's really about data collection. So the kids are told that they can earn points and tokens, which is the mission by getting active, points save lives. And how is that? Because the more points they earn, some social impact investor or you know, do-gooder around the world will unlock food boxes for kids in third world in the third world. But really it's about child labor, introducing guilt in children at such a small age about their uh, you know, having a burden that they made other people, uh, other country kids poor. Uh, they are being programmed to earn tokens. It's a transition also of the financial system, completion badges, and then of course social credits. So you can see how all the activities being done in school today are in line with the new international economic order and the whole social control system. So it's really about data and control. Right, uh, April 2022, it was announced at the Department of State website that the multi-stakeholder internet governance has taken place, which means the international bankers in the United Nations have taken control of the global internet. So expect a zero trust world on the internet in the future, wherein if we don't accept the digital ID, and if we are not compliant with the agenda, then we won't be able to access modern telecommunications via the internet. And at the heart of this will be the digital ID because you will need your face and biometric authentication to unlock your access to the internet and stay on the internet in real time. In fact, in the future, I expect based on certain laws that somebody has tried to initiate in Congress three years ago in the name of uh, safety for children because of child pornography, they want to be able to take away all secure transactions on the internet between browsers and what people are viewing so that they want to do real-time eye tracking of every human being while they're using any device. So think about the implications of that. Uh, this is some photographs I did, uh, you know, took a couple of years ago when I came to Montana. Uh, or uh, when I came to Montana, there were no cameras anywhere that I lived, but all these have come up since I have arrived here. So we have intersection cameras, these LED lights, surveillance lights are up in many streets in Kalispell. They have more and more 5G microwave towers coming up uh, in various spots. Uh, retail shops, all the major ones have a lot of cameras at checkouts. They have face recognition cameras, four of them, at the entrance of this Walmart. So. Once you go through this foyer and enter the store, you are being tracked every square foot of your movements inside Walmart, and they are tracking what you're putting in your cart, and your carbon footprint is being updated based on what you're putting into your cart. And there are all these uh, you know, surveillance cameras and LED lights in the parking lot by the dozens. A car wash in Kalispell near my house has 12 facial recognition cameras and they also have license plate readers, which will be li linking to your uh, car and your water footprint is being updated. So this is all in play as we speak. Uh, I encourage people to be highly observant when they go out and take pictures, right? Uh, there's a company called ID.me, no identity left behind. This is a public-private partnership, supposedly. They work with state governments and federal governments for all sorts of benefits for uh, you know employment benefits and veterans benefits and it's in the name of you know equity and inclusivity and what, how they trick you into signing up for a digital ID effectively is by using your password with your driver's license or passport and then make you take a 
video selfie to unlock your access for your benefits. So this is how they are. Ush this is one of the ways they are ushering in the digital ID for many folks. So the key to understanding is that once we accept a digital ID, it's game over for humanity. Because we will then have a digital twin and our digital twin will be interacting with you know, uh, with other digital twins and activities in the metaverse. And so this is kind of a dark agenda. So at a, on a technology level, I've spoken about zero trust. I just made this slide not too long ago to try and explain how humanity will be enslaved by the digital transformation and what the digital transformation is. So there are five pillars to the digital transformation. The first one is the cameras and the sensors and LED lights, which is the Internet of Things linked to your digital ID. Right? When the IoT and sensors, they capture the data, they send it over the network to the cloud. So the cloud is the second pillar of this transformation. And then in the cloud is hardware and software algorithms, which is artificial intelligence running and processing all the data that goes up to the cloud. And that's the third pillar. After AI processes the data, it takes all the relevant data and puts it on a blockchain, which is, think of it as servers in the cloud, which are really a digital ledger of information that's being locked in. And finally, it's cybersecurity, pretty much zero trust, which is finally going to lock you out of access. So all these five pillars need to work in unison together in order to enslave humanity. If any one of these pillars fails, then their whole plan and this entire digital transformation fails. Now think about it. We human beings, like we individual, at an individual level or a group level, where do we have control? We certainly don't have control of the cloud because cloud is essentially servers and computers owned by private corporations. So we can't do anything about it. AI is algorithms running on hardware owned by corporations. We can't do anything about it. Blockchain is also a bunch of you know, static memory and on servers in the cloud. We can't do anything about that. Cybersecurity is a bunch of algorithms and software that is giving you or preventing access to devices. We can't do anything about that. The only thing we have access to is something we can see and touch physically and is being put up in our public lands and private spaces, which is the IoT. So we can do something about that. And if we can prevent the IoT from performing the functions that it's said to perform, then we can disable this enslavery system. Right? So. Think about it, it's all linked to the digital ID and the identity slavery system. Some of the companies that are involved are the World Economic Forum, World Bank, IMF, United Nations, UNESCO, UNICEF, and a whole bunch of others. So another way to demonstrate this type of slavery system is your data being captured by IoT on a blockchain combined with the digital ID linked to the digital currency of sustainability, carbon, water, social credits, etc. This is your digital leash and it will be implemented by conditional access via zero trust. So this is just another way of presenting the information that you know I thought might be interesting. And it's what I call the final lockdown. So once the system is in place fully and all the switches are turned on, they will control all access to all aspects of life and nature for humanity. So in summary, artificial intelligence is the beast. The beast needs food. The food is data. And the conduits to this data are the sensors, cameras, radars, smart lights, 5G towers, autonomous driving cars, etc. The only way to starve the beast is to take down the sensors of the IoT and have them undone because they were done without our permission. Since data and sensors feed the beast, they need to be undone. 
So it's really important to think through the digital transformation, the IoT, how AI fits in, and how we can starve the beast. Right? So the entire world is now in a state where we have silent weapons pointing at us, and if we don't do something about it, we will be in invisible chains for the rest of our lives. Right? So we have a fight like no other in the history of modern civilization. And the question to everybody is, what are you going to do about it?